Over the past decade, financial markets started behaving in a very strange way. Things that should have happened didn't happen, while things that made no sense happened every Tuesday. Assets which were overvalued became more and more expensive, while those which were undervalued continued to decline. The market's reaction to news events was completely counterintuitive. Every rational investment principle has been thrown out of the window and replaced with rampant speculation. Those who embraced the insanity saw enormous returns while those who refused to play along counted their losses. So why do financial markets behave in such an irrational way? Is this madness ever going to end? An old adage in the financial world claims that one should always buy low and sell high. This makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If you buy an undervalued asset, and sell it when it is overvalued, you are certain to make a profit. But in the past decade, this strategy simply didn't work. Tech stocks, which according to various indicators were overvalued as far back as 2015, continue to rally relentlessly. Commodities, on the other hand, which according to the same measures were undervalued, kept going down. It was as though the laws of economics were suspended, and fundamental analysis didn't matter anymore. I argue that none of it was natural, and that it was all due to central bank intervention. In the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, the Federal Reserve slashed its interest rate to zero, and started printing huge amounts of money. It used this money in order to bail out the failing banks and take all of the toxic mortgage-backed securities off their hands. Later, they started buying government bonds in order to suppress their yields. As I've explained in my previous videos, this had an indirect effect on the stock market and particularly the large tech companies which were suddenly able to borrow money very cheaply and use it to buy back their own shares. Many people were rightfully concerned that this would lead to inflation. They invested in precious metals because historically they performed well during times of crisis and high inflation. At first, this seemed like a good decision. The price of gold and silver rallied and during 2011, they both set a new all-time high. But the anticipated inflation was nowhere in sight. Or more accurately, it was not expressed in the CPI. Commodity prices, which recovered somewhat from the 2008 crash, continued to decline. Soon after, the price of precious metals retreated as well, and they entered a prolonged correction. Those who were prudent and tried to protect their savings from inflation got absolutely killed. From that point on, things just got more and more weird. By 2013, the S&P 500 index recovered completely and began to set new all-time highs. Although unemployment in the US was still over 7% and GDP growth was tepid, the stock market was booming. As a matter of fact, bad news for the economy was considered as good news for stocks because it ensured that the Federal Reserve would continue with its easy money policy. The discrepancy between Wall Street and Main Street was becoming apparent and for the first time since the Great Depression, the net worth of the top 1% exceeded that of the bottom 90% a strange and previously unknown asset class first caught the attention of the public, as the price of Bitcoin reached $1,000 for the first time. In hindsight, 
Bitcoin acted as an outlet for the excess liquidity which was constantly generated by the Federal Reserve. Since gold failed to serve as a hedge against inflation, the young generation adopted its digital substitute instead. At the end of 2014, the Federal Reserve ended QE3, and the stock market rally began to fizzle out. Investors were concerned that Janet Yellen, which replaced Ben Bernanke as Fed Chair, would soon begin to hike rates and that the celebration in Wall Street would end. But Yellen postponed the rate hikes time and time again, allowing the S&P 500 to remain artificially elevated for another year. Only at the end of 2015 did she finally hike rates by a mere 25 basis points, which immediately led to a sharp correction in the stock market. This was such a harrowing experience for her that she refrained from repeating it until the end of 2016. By then, the Fed's funds rate was at or close to zero for eight whole years. But in early 2017, Donald Trump became president. And his promised tax cuts could replace the constant support which the Federal Reserve has given the markets until then. Stocks rallied once more, this time not based on monetary stimulus, but on the hope that genuine growth was around the corner. This alone was enough to propel the S&P 500 another 30%. In 2018, Jerome Powell took over as Fed Chair and tried to take the tightening cycle a step further by selling some of the bonds which were purchased during QE and allowing the Federal Reserve's balance sheet to shrink. The S&P 500 didn't like it and entered a technical formation known as a broadening top, which usually ends with a crash. Powell first tried to placate the market by calling off any further rate hikes, but it clearly wasn't enough. During the summer of 2019, the interbank lending market froze up. Overnight repo rates spiked as high as 10%, indicating a lack of liquidity in the banking system. Powell was forced to cut rates and resume the money printing. This about face gave the stock market yet another boost and helped it reach a new all-time high. This episode in monetary history has been largely forgotten due to the events of COVID-19, which happened shortly after. But it demonstrated how the Federal Reserve was committed to the preservation of the bull market in stocks. Whenever there was any danger that the bubble may pop, they came to the rescue with another dose of cheap credit. All the while, Commodities continue to languish. The CRB Commodity Index hovered below 200 points, like it did 20 years before. Adjusted for inflation, the situation looked even worse. In real terms, commodity prices were trading at all-time lows. Even though we all need commodities in order to survive, nobody wanted to invest in them and the companies which are producing them had difficulty getting funded. This also had a negative effect on worker compensation. Anyone working in agriculture, mining or energy couldn't get a decent pay, because the prices of their products remained stagnant. Even though the Federal Reserve was constantly printing money, none of it went into the commodity sector. It all flowed into financial assets, such as tech stocks, bonds, and cryptocurrencies. It's not that we didn't have any inflation back then, but it didn't manifest itself in consumer goods, such as food or fuel, and therefore it was completely ignored. A few months later, the pandemic has erupted, and the markets experienced a full-blown meltdown. The Federal Reserve panicked. Although the crisis was exogenous in nature, 
and had nothing to do with lending conditions, they decided to cut rates all the way to zero and flood the markets with liquidity. Three trillion dollars were printed overnight and an additional two trillion were printed in the next couple of years. This unprecedented money printing served as rocket fuel for the stock market, more than doubling the value of the S&P 500 index compared to its pandemic lows. Flushed with cash from the stimulus checks, people started speculating like crazy. During this time, Bitcoin reached an all-time high of $68,000. Other cryptocurrencies, such as Dogecoin or Shiba Inu, saw incredible gains, although they were nothing but meme coins and didn't represent any real economic activity. People invested in SPACs, which are shell companies without any commercial operations. They paid millions of dollars for NFTs, which grant them the exclusive ownership over worthless digital files. In my view, these were the hallmarks of a speculative mania, which has reached its final explosive stage. Nowadays, the enthusiasm around these so-called assets has subsided. People have far fewer dollars to speculate with due to higher interest rates and the rising cost of living. Bitcoin is trading at about a half of its all-time high, and other cryptocurrencies have lost 90% of their value or more. The SPAC boom is over, and there is hardly any interest in NFTs anymore. But the S&P 500 index is still hovering close to its 2021 highs and very few Wall Street analysts are willing to admit that we've been living in a bubble all these years. Most of them expect the bull market to continue indefinitely. One thing is certain. Some of the liquidity which the Fed has created has finally leaked into the commodity sector, generating inflation the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1980s. Since their 2020 lows, commodities have rallied substantially. However, compared to other asset classes, they are still very cheap. For instance, compared to the S&P 500, the CRB Commodity Index needs to rally 500% in order to reach its 2008 high. This means that commodities still have plenty of room to run. If you've been suspicious of this bull market all along, my message to you is that you're not crazy. If you recognize that smartphones and social media are not essential to human existence, but tangible commodities certainly are, then you're in the right direction. The laws of economics have not been repealed, and valuations still matter. By printing money and keeping interest rates close to zero for such a long time, central banks have created a huge imbalance, which will need to be resolved. If I am correct, the next decade will look nothing like the previous one. Instead, it will look very much like the 1970s, with very little growth and persistently high inflation. The Federal Reserve will no longer be able to support the stock market, and the indices will probably grind lower for years to come. Vital commodities, on the other hand, will be all the rage, and just like we've seen during the 1970s, they will be led by the precious metals, gold and silver. Thank you for listening to the Silver Hermit Podcast. If you like this content, please donate in the link which appears in the description below. Please subscribe to this channel and share it with your friends and family. Hit the bell icon to be notified whenever I release a new video. Remember, I am not a licensed financial advisor. This video is intended for general informational purposes only and should not be regarded as investment advice. 
before taking any investment decision, please consult with a professional financial advisor who may assess your personal investment objectives and needs.